Tim said, I'm going to do sort of a, a brief overview, and then everybody's going to give an individual talk, and then we're going to um, hopefully turn this into a panel discussion. Um, hopefully, you'll have questions to ask. If you don't, I do. Um, so despite nearly 350 years of practice, we still do a fairly poor job of measuring the quality and impact of research papers and the work of individual researchers. Uh, most of our system for determining funding and career advancement revolves around one metric, the impact factor. Uh, the impact factor is a reasonable, if somewhat flawed, metric for measuring the quality and importance of a journal. It is, however, a terrible metric for measuring the quality and importance of an individual paper or the work of an individual scientist. Um, the good news is that technology has progressed to a point where we can do better. Um, we, we can now track the life of each individual paper after it's been published. Uh, we can better understand how it's read and how it's used. And, and this creates a tremendous opportunity for new alternative metrics, uh, dubbed altmetrics, um, and then they can give us a much better sense of a paper's true impact. Um, so while the concept here is both uh, obvious and welcome, it's probably premature to start celebrating. Clearly, by moving uh, from a print world to a digital world, um, we, we can now see some detailed measurements beyond just knowing X number of copies of Journal Y were mailed out to readers. Uh, and really collecting and analyzing data is of great value and, and, and decision making should always be evidence based. Um, but having been in the scholarly publishing world for the last few decades, um, it's really hard to view any new development without a serious amount of skepticism. Um, you know, we, we take a lot of trips up and down the, the hype cycle here, and so you always have to ask, you know, is, is, this, is this a useful tool and how should we really be using it? So the first question you ask is, well, you know, why do we need metrics at all? Um, so clearly the best way to make a decision about a researcher is a, a thorough understanding of their research. You know, you should interview their colleagues, read all their papers, probably read all the papers that cite them, and really get a sense of their true impact on the field. And, and, and that works really well if you, you know, one, have a deep level of subject knowledge, and two, have a completely unlimited amount of time. Um, most decisions, though, uh, or many decisions at least, have to be made by non-experts. Um, university administrators, grant officers, other people like that can't be expected to analyze high-level research. Librarians have to make decisions uh, about an incredibly broad range of, of research publications. Researchers often find themselves venturing into new fields uh, where, where they really quickly need to get a sense of what's important and who does good work. Uh, when I was in graduate school, my lab worked on a gene that was involved in the reproductive system in mice. So, you know, we knocked it out in a mouse, and the resulting mouse mutants were perfectly fertile, but they had major problems with their digestive system. So we had to shift gears and suddenly become a, uh, a large intestine development lab, and it was something we knew nothing about, and we really had to figure out how to quickly get a handle on the, on the field. Um, so, you know, if there are objective ways for non-experts to quickly get a handle on the quality of work done by a researcher uh, or expressed by a research article, I think that's an incredibly helpful thing in these sort of situations. Scale is the other big driver for the use of metrics. Uh, and I'll give you some anecdotal evidence um, to give you a sense of the scale that we're dealing with. Uh, a good friend just went through the academic job hunt process, and, and I'm happy to report she landed her first uh, principal investigator job. But as she was making the rounds on the job market, um, for every tenure track job she applied to, she was up against a minimum of four to 500 qualified applicants, uh, and around uh, between 35 and 50 of what she referred to as superstar applicants. Now, the task for each search committee was to decide which five applicants they were going to bring in for interviews. Um, I, I spoke to a colleague who's on the faculty at Johns Hopkins, and he confirms those numbers. Every tenure track job his department advertises gets a minimum between four and 500 qualified applicants. So we all know that the best way to make these sorts of decisions is based on this deep understanding of the work of each individual. But really, there's no practical way to get that done. Um, you know, reading one paper from each applicant would be a full-time job, let alone reading their entire publication history. Um, same problem applies to the enormous number of applications that come in when grant funding is offered. So to deal with scale, we do need some shortcuts. Are there relatively quick ways to triage a huge pile of applications down to a workable level where you can start in uh, on building that deeper under understanding that's, that's uh, necessary? Um, Right now, a lot of this is done by impact factor. So, you know, I don't, I don't know anyone who, who really loves the impact factor, um, possible exception of, of people from Thomson Reuters, if you're in the room, I'm sorry. Um, and, and used properly, the impact factor is not that bad of a metric. The problem is, is it's, it's terribly misused. Um, it's relied upon to make all sorts of judgments where it really doesn't apply well. Uh, you know, the impact factor was designed as a way of comparing journals to one another. 
Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible metric, though, for understanding the quality of an individual researcher or, or an individual paper. Um, and, and so the impact factor is based on citation, you know, essentially a paper's author publicly stating their previous paper had enough impact on the current work that it deserves mention. But it's not without problems. It's slow, it looks at something of an arbitrary two-year window, it favors review articles over original research, it can be greatly swayed by a small number of highly cited articles, it's nearly impossible to meaningfully compare from field to field, and it offers a false degree of precision. Um, so we know the impact factor is useful for some purposes, but flawed for many of the things we need to know. Um, so, but it would, it would really be a mistake, though, to think that the value of, of these alternative metrics is just creating a better impact factor, uh, a better, more meaningful single metric for all purposes. We've reached a point with uh, sufficient computational power, you know, we're in the era of big data, and that sort of reductionist approach is, is archaic. Um, the, the key to understanding alternative metrics, new metrics, is not to think in terms of creating a better version of the impact factor, but instead to think in terms of creating hundreds if not thousands of better versions of the impact factor, each customized to serve the needs of the individual question being asked by the individual stakeholder. Uh, think of a grant officer at a funding agency trying to decide where should I award funding, a, a new graduate student trying to keep up with the literature. Um, a development officer trying to raise donations for a research institute, uh, a marketing manager at a pharmaceutical company trying to raise awareness about a new drug, or a librarian trying to make choices about how to best spend a serials budget. Each of these cases presents a, a need for a different type of data to inform decision making. So those custom metrics for each stakeholder, that's, that's the upside of having a near unlimited number of ways to analyze the data, and it's the really intriguing uh, promise of alternative metrics. Um, the downside is we now have this fire hose of data, this sort of overwhelming quantity of information, and the current state of the field is separating, trying to figure out how to separate the signal from the noise. Um, we need to be careful that we really understand what's being measured, uh, what is the metric telling us. Many approaches towards new metrics seem backwards from a scientific perspective. Um, rather than starting with a question and developing a methodology to best answer that question, th there seems to be a tendency to start with an answer and try and retrofit that to a question. A metric's chosen because it's something that, that can easily be measured, and then the researcher uh, or the, per the company behind it tries to convince us that it actually means something. Um, and and I, I want to give you two quotes to, to keep in mind when thinking about metrics. Um, the first is from uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould. And he basically explained in his 1988 essay on Joe DiMaggio's record hitting streak um, that our brains like patterns. Um, uh, there are these evolutionary adaptations to seeing patterns and they continue to drive the way that we see the world. Uh, you know, the, the plant with leaves shaped like this is poisonous, don't eat it. The plant with leaves shaped like this is delicious, let's go eat some of that. Uh, that big animal with the stripes and the sharp teeth, let's try and stay away from that. Um, and, and he describes uh, this sort of phenomenon as, as, you know, as this quote, we must have comforting answers. We see pattern, for pattern surely exists even in a purely random world. Our error lies not in the perception of pattern, but in automatically imbuing pattern with meaning, especially with meaning that can bring us comfort or dispel confusion. We must impart meaning to a pattern, and we like meanings that tell us, uh, we like meanings that tell us about heroism, valor, and excellence. So there's a natural tendency in humans to want to create stories, to, to take available data, and to make sense of it by uh, using it to show patterns that tell a story. The danger, though, comes from our tendency to do this, uh, even when the meaning behind the story isn't necessarily there. Um, so when we look at alternative metrics, or really any kind of metric at all, we have to carefully examine the stories they tell us to understand whether they hold any significance. Um, the quote on this slide sums things up nicely. It's from William Bruce Cameron. Uh, it's often wrongly attributed to Albert Einstein. Um, I think at this point Einstein has uh, surpassed Yogi Berra as far as not saying half the things he said. Um, but the quote is, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Um, you know, there have been proposals that these alternative metrics um, should be used in assessing research or performance, for funding, for career advancement. Um, and we really need to better understand what they actually measure and, and you know, whether we really care about the things they do measure. Um, you know, the question is really how much should we rely on metrics um, uh, in general. And I think we'll get into a discussion of these things a little bit later. Um, each of our speakers is going to give their presentation now. So